hope everybody here is enjoying the weather. On behalf of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, uh, I'd like to welcome you to our panel, 21st Century Juvenile Justice, a Texas-Sized Problem. My name is Derek Cohen, and I'm a policy analyst in the Center for Effective Justice and with our Right on Crime campaign. Now, the subtitle for this panel, a Texas-Sized Pro Texas Problem, is deliberate. The vast expanse of Texas makes organizing and administrating a centralized juvenile justice system near impossible. This geographic and jurisdictional spread uh, basically precludes any economy of scale that is enjoyed in, we'll say, less substantial states. Um, as, as a result of this, it costs Texans $367 per child per day to house in a state facility. And contrast this with $31 dollars and 56 cents uh, to house them on uh, post-release super post supervision. Comp add this to uh, federal mandates and jurisprudence and it becomes a costly proposition indeed. Still, Texas has a lot to be proud of in the area, in the area of juvenile justice. The juvenile justice apparatus has actually been able to overcome a lot of the issues that has plagued it in the past uh, through quality oversight and leadership. Each year, fewer and fewer children are sent to state facilities here in Texas, and that is in no small part due to some of the, uh, some of the representation we have on this panel here. A recent report by the Juvenile Law Center has ranked Texas, Texas as fourth in the nation for potential expunctions and confidentiality of juvenile records, thereby pre preventing collateral consequences farther down the line for juvenile deviance. TJJ, TJJD specifically, in the melding of the job functions of the Texas Youth Commission and the Texas Juvenile Probation Authority, has managed to keep nominal spending on par with 2001 levels, which actually uh, led to a real savings of $22 million between FY 2012 and FY 2014 alone. And most importantly, this has not come at any cost to public safety. Now that is not to say that we here in Texas and in the Juvenile Justice Department should be resting on our laurels. There are still many things that need to be addressed. Texas is one of the few states that uses the criminal justice system to address truancy issues. To that end, status offenders could still end up in jail should they be found in violation of a juvenile court order, and that court order for, is for a crime that would not be so should the individual be an adult. Texas has by far, by far and away the most onerous training requirements for our correctional officers at 300 hours. This requirement is so high that if we were to eliminate two and a half weeks worth of the curriculum, we would still be tied for first place. This state has also dragged its feet in closing a juvenile justice facility, still keeping it staffed with a skeleton crew that is hemorrhaging money by the day. Texas has accomplished a great deal and still has a lot left to accomplish, which is actually what brings us here today. The question put most simply, what can we do to press provide public safety, the most bang for the taxpayer dollar, and the best justice for the youth that are involved in the juvenile justice system? As you can see, we've assembled quite the August panel here of stakeholders and lawmakers to discuss this issue. Uh, and after, after the presentation is uh, concluded, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers. So let's get started, shall we? Our first speaker is Dr. Tony Fabello. Dr. Fabello is the Austin-based director of the Research Division of the Council of States Governments in their Justice Center. He served as the JFA Institute, he served the JFA Institute as a senior research associate and prior to that served as the head of the Criminal Justice Policy Council. He's assisted every legislature since 1985 in developing criminal justice policies. Dr. Fabello has his BA in political science from Loyola, his master's and PhD from the University of Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Tony Fabello. Hey, thank you. Thank you everybody. Good, good afternoon, I guess. I'm drinking coffee. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you Derek, Chelsea and Jose and Bill. Thanks to be here. Um, so let me, we have what, 10 minutes or so? So I want to tell you a little bit about the study that we are about to release that is looking at the whole juvenile justice system. I cannot tell you the findings, but at least announced that we're releasing the study on January 2029 20, and give you an idea of what questions are we addressing. And then I just want to make some general observations because I was telling Jose I'm old now. I turned 59 yesterday and I just realized giving a tour to some friends of the Capitol the other day 
you know, I was pointing to this Tasho Bullock. I said, I knew him, and Bill Hovey, I knew him. And I was driving out Bill Clemens building, I knew him, and I Richard Bridge, I knew him. And my friend said, damn, you're old. You know, all these dead people that have names in buildings and bridges. And, uh, and I'm saying, yes, uh, I realize that. So I figured, make some observations about this system looking at 30 years. Uh, of going around and my 18th legislative session coming up. Uh, so, so let me tell you about this study. We have tracked 300,000 UNLs in Texas uh, with the group starting in 2006. Every case disposed in the system until recently 2012. Uh, we tracking in particular a group of TYC eligible kids, 55,000 and try to look at three questions. The first question is, has the depopulation of TYC facilities impacted public safety? As you know, the commitments to TYC declined from about 2,700, 2006 to 800 last year. Population declined from 4,700 to about 1,000 last year. And the question is, when you have this decline and these kids essentially stay behind in the community, what has been the impact on that on recidivism? Uh, we're going to be able to answer that looking at a very complex multivariate analysis model of all the records of these kids that we have tracked, their recidivism rate, which we mean re-arrest rate, uh, over a one to three year period. The second question that we are looking at is the question of whether the increase in probation funding has positively impacted uh, recidivism outcomes. Uh, the probation system, believe it or not, have seen a 98% increase in per capita expenditure uh, between 2005 to 2012. Uh, we're spending now more per probation kit than uh, what we spend educating a kid in Texas, about 8,569. That was about $4,337 in 2005, and it begs the question, since we have increased this funding to that level, what is the impact on recidivism? Are we getting out better outcomes out of the funding? We will have an answer to that. And then related to that, the third question is, uh, what have we learned after examining eight counties that we selected in Texas and the report will tell you how we selected them uh, based on, on a very strict methodology of looking at their recidivism rate. Uh, we look at Travis, Tarrant County, Cameron, Lubbock, Harris, El Paso, Victoria, and Dallas, and dig through those systems and try to answer the question, what is it that they're doing right? What is it that they're not doing so good? What lessons can we learn and how that can apply to a model uh, to improve the system? Uh, uh, so that report, January 29, in the Supreme Court chambers at 10 o'clock. Uh, we're writing it now. It'd be ready the day before in usual fashion, but it'd be really good. And uh, you're invited to go and, and show up in the event, and the report will be in the website then, and you'll get answers to those questions. Uh, three observations, being an old person. Uh, the first one is kind of good news. There are fewer kids that are being arrested uh, in Texas, but so you know, there are fewer kids being arrested everywhere. So there is nothing particular about what we have done in Texas that you can say, well, because of that, you impacted arrests. Um, in Florida, between 2006 and 2012, it's a growing state, high uh, Hispanic population, young population, 35% decrease in arrests. In California, 48% uh, decrease in arrests, and in Texas, 31% increase in arrests. And if you look at other states, you've seen that, and nobody really have a good answer for that. My answer deals with iPods and iPhones and Facebook and Instagram, which I don't know half of that what it means, but uh, it means that these kids are inside and not outside, maybe, and that's a theory I've thrown out. And some people say, well, maybe there's something to it. 
Uh, supervision techniques and a lot of stuff have gotten better in the system. We have risk and needs assessment that are routinely used now, like 30 years ago. Uh, at least they're there. Whether they're used well or not, you will find an answer in our report. Uh, more evidence of what works, the so-called evidence-based practices, and again, the evidence is out there. The trick is in implementing this. Electronic records are in place, which facilitates a lot of interactions. Uh, there's more interaction with the mental health, social services system, and for sure, probation officers are better trained than they have ever been. Yet, recidivism rates are fairly high as measured by rearrest. The TYC releases, when you track them three years down the road, 77% of them are rearrested almost 44 or 44% percent are reincarcerated, mainly in adult facilities because the majority of the population in TYC, and I'm using TYC, I know it's TJJT, but TYC, I'm stuck to the old days. Uh, the majority of the population in TYC is actually adults, believe it or not. About 60% percent of the population in their facilities are adult because they get in at a very late age, around 15 and a half, 16, they serve two years and they become adults there. So, so, so recidivism are, is high, and it's high in the community too. Uh, more or less a 53%, 54% rearrest rate after three years. And again, we're going to try to answer the question whether this has improved and whether this funding has had an impact. But I'm going to suggest that funding is not the issue. The probation system today received 13,000 fewer referrals to the system that it received in 1986. It's a smaller system in great part because of the decline in arrests and so forth. Yet the probation system budget, uh, the state budget, not counting the local budget, is 485% larger than it was in 1986, adjusting for inflation. So it's not an issue of, oh, we have not been able to impact recidivism because we lack money. Uh, we think it's more an issue of how you're doing since and how you're targeting programs and what you can do to improve that. Accountability at the local level uh, for state funding is lacking. I just got the two-minute warning. But I read you from 1986, a Sunset Commission report that says the agency should place uh, an ongoing study of the most effective program for rehabilitation of juveniles as a top priority. In 96, they said it again, although improving the quality of probation services is in large part of TYC's mission. Uh, TJPC at the time does not know how effectively state money is used by local probation department. Uh, the same mandate in 09, in, o, in 11, 2011, the agency is just not doing that. So how many times are you going to ask over a 30-year period that they need to target the state funding in a way that maximizes the impact on recidivism and maximizing accountability with that state funding? And the usual claim is, oh, the counties cannot be told what to do. And I suggested to Chelsea and some other people that they look at the model with the Texas Indigen Defense Commission, where they actually have successfully done that and tried to do that. Finally, this third observation is that the youth incarceration model needs to be revisited. Uh, a lot of issues dealing with the type of facilities, the dorm configuration, the type of population, high staff turnover rate, 100 uh, juvenile correctional officers hired, after a year, about 46 still in the job because most of them have quit, and the cost is extreme. Stream. If you take the 800 kids coming into the system uh, last year, the new commitments, that number of kids for the length of stay, which is about 18 months, is going to cost $162 million. $162 million can be used to educate 20,000 Texas student for a year, just to give you a relative indication of the amount of money that we're spending. 85% will get rearrested after five years. So out of all that huge pile of money, 
uh, they can be very legitimate questions what we're getting in return. Conclusion, since the time is up, uh, hopefully the study will set the tone for a methodical look at outcomes, the relationship with local system. There are already local system like Fort Worth reacting to what we're going to say and working on, local, on a local plan to improve their outcomes. Uh, hopefully it will set the tone for that. It will set the tone for a conversation to review the, uh, the TYC component of the system and incarceration of the system. Uh, that's uh, 10 minutes and uh, so stay tuned and come up uh, that day and you're welcome uh, to join us and we'll have more information then but this gives you a little outline of where we might be headed. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fabella. Chelsea Buckholz joined the Texas Juvenile Justice Department in August of 2010 as Deputy General Counsel. She became General Counsel in April of 2014. As a former Texas Governor's appointee of the Juvenile Services and uh, Facilities Transition Team, uh, Chelsea's brought a wealth of experience uh, to her current position. So without any further ado, Chelsea Buckles of TJJD. Well, I'm here on behalf of uh, David Riley, our new executive director who would much prefer to be here today, but instead he is in a hospital in Houston recovering from surgery. So he sends his regress, regrets for multiple reasons. I have a couple of um, follow-ups to what Dr. Fabello said, and I'll, I'll get to that. I want to make a few comments just about um, our new, still fairly new agency, Texas Juvenile Justice Department. It was created in December of 2011 in the midst of what I know all of you know uh, were years of reform. Um, in some ways, the merge of the two former agencies continues um, to occur. We, we still find ways in which we, um, we need to fully merge, and uh, we're working to do that. Most of that is infrastructure related. Um, and some of that is, is, um, is a natural distinction. On one side of our house, we provide funding to counties who keep kids close to home, and they're doing that at a higher level than, than ever before. As Dr. Fabello mentioned, we had less than 800 commitments to state side of things last year, and that's because counties uh, are keeping more kids. We provide regula regulatory oversight to counties and also technical assistance when, those, when that's necessary. Each juvenile county probation department is governed by a local board. They're not our employees. Um, we simply have a, have a partnership. Also, Dr. Fabello mentioned that um, there are fewer kids in the entire system. Um, back in 2009, there were 97,000 kids who entered the juvenile justice system or referred to a, a county juvenile probation department. Today, well, last year, we had significantly less than that, uh, 63,000. Um, so referrals are down. On the other side of our shop, on the state facility side of things, we also have a declining population. You'll see that um, in 2007, we had more than 4,000 kids who were in state facilities. And today, we have uh, just over 1,300 on any given day. That includes kids in our five um, operating um, high restriction facilities, our eight halfway houses, and then about 100 kids at any given time in contract placement. On the back end of their stay with us, they're often placed on parole, and we have parole offices all, all over the state. I think part of the reason for the declining population is this is happening nationwide. Um, we also only take kids who are adjudicated with felonies now. It used to be that we also had uh, misdemeanors. Also, the legislature um, uh, over time has funded commitment diversion programs, which keeps kids from penetrating the juvenile justice system further than, than they should be. Dr. Favello mentioned his report that will be published at the end of the month, and we anticipate that it will reveal a continued need for improvement of youth outcomes, and that's system-wide. 
And to do that, we have history, our research has shown that kids need to stay closer to home and they need to be in small facilities in the least restrictive environment, it, receiving services based on their specific needs. We've convened a work group that has worked all fall and then actually has a meeting today with our county partners to address how to improve recidivism, how to keep more kids close to home. We also think the focus needs to be on duplicating effective programming at the county level. And Dr. Fabello mentioned his uh, uh, need for performance-based funding, Sunset Report from 1986. Obviously, we've made very slow progress, perhaps too slow. Um, this report provides a, a perfect opportunity for that to come back to the forefront to, to, to have a conversation about how to um, make that progress happen more quickly. The majority of our performance monitoring today is based on terms of our contract with counties. Are they sticking to allowable expenditures? Are, they, um, are their budgets accurate and reasonable based on the purpose for funding, that type of thing? We monitor uh, performance in those areas and, and provide technical assistance to get counties back on track when, when they need that. And if it comes to it, we do have structures in place uh, to withhold or request uh, refunded uh, money. In terms of tying funds to youth outcomes, this is an area that we need to shore up. TJJD's largest grant by far is provided to uh, counties in a very flexible way that's intended to provide, uh, maintain local control and autonomy. But during the, this current biennium, we have been providing uh, training to counties on how to develop programs to control specific outcomes and goals in mind and designing programs with outcomes in mind and then evaluating whether those programs are successful. The next step is to tie funding to, th to that type of performance. We're examining how to do that and look forward to that conversation. We expect that to be a, um, a part of this coming legislative session. We know that it will require a ramp up but even today, um, we receive refunds from counties who cannot spend the money that we give them. As we get those, we could be reallocating those funds based on performance. Now we do so based on need. Um, and we can slowly grow a percentage of available funding um, to set aside to use per, on a performance basis. But to do so, we really need a bolstered research team that we don't currently have to be able to measure the data that we do have and collect uh, so that we can properly measure what programs are effective. We're grateful for the report. It refocuses our conversation back to youth outcomes, which is the mission of our agency, to create positive youth outcomes system-wide. It's a perfect time to do that in that we have a new executive director who can lead that charge beautifully. David Riley came to us from Bear County where he was for 17 years. Very loved there. I'm surprised that he wanted to leave. He's a social worker at heart, one who doesn't give up on kids. And he wants to ensure that each youth that comes to us is given the best care that we can provide. As Mr. Riley has settled into his new role, Many have asked him in various contexts, what do you need to, do, to succeed? And he's spent a lot of time examining and thinking about what, what the response is to that. And I think that's gonna be a majority of the conversation we'd like to offer during session. But when we look at those needs, what we've done is we've looked at our current system, our facilities, our staffing models, our funding levels, training requirements, our system, as driven through policy developed by the legislature historically over time. But the world changes, policy, uh, our population has declined, policies shift, focuses change, and we expect to discuss and take direction from the legislature regarding whether or not our current system, our current model, continues to work with such a different picture. And in our current system, there are many challenges that we face. As Dr. Fabello mentioned, we, um, we have, well, I don't know that you mentioned this one. We have inadequate staffing levels. When Mr. Riley came to our agency, he was very surprised to learn that we have unmanned pickets in some locations, in classrooms without correctional officers, 
And in some instances, in some instances we have officers who watch kids, but when something goes wrong, they don't have backup. This is unheard of in county facilities, but it is a reality in state facilities. We also have high turnover. 38% of our correctional, um, uh, we have 38% turnover rate in any given year uh, for our correctional staff. And as Dr. Fabello mentioned, about half of our um, newly hired correctional staff leave within the first year. So we train people as fast as they leave in some instances. We asked our independent ombudsman recently to conduct focus groups at each facility to learn just why this was happening. There were a lot of takeaways from that, but one of them was that we're not training our staff to succeed. And some of that we can fix today. But some of it we need help from the legislature. And I'm not sure, this sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but we think that we need to lessen the 300 hour requirement. And to, by doing that, we will have more resources to continue training in the long term. I'd like to say, in essence, it's a little bit um, like changing from a fire hydrant strategy and then not doing anything. To apply additional knowledge, we provide those building blocks. We also need to develop our staff to be uh, specifically new super to become strong leaders. We have challenges in recruiting. We also have high costs to maintain facilities. We have institutional, prison-like environments that it sometimes creates institutional um, culture. We have inefficient configurations that don't mirror the ratios that we need. And we also have what I like to call the contagion factor. What perhaps years ago were kids with fewer challenges bringing along those within a dorm who had perhaps more challenges Today we have kids with a high number of challenges and any way in which they bring each other along tends not to be what used to be historically positive. There's more of a negative feeding off of one another. We've spent a lot of time addressing how we can remedy these challenges and the answer is not simple but I do think that there is some simplicity to it and that is through adequate staffing and training. By focusing on staffing and training, outcomes would improve. And just as Dr. Fabello has indicated, that's what we need to focus on. It isn't all about money. There are some things we can do today. But if we can't, for example, create a safe and healthy environment for our facilities, then treatment will be compromised. And as I alluded to earlier, if the intent of the legislature is to continue to decrease the population in our state facilities, the current model likely cannot be sustained. Half full, large, rural facilities will continue to be a challenge. And so we stand ready and willing to aid the legislature in finding a model that is conducive to the juvenile justice policy and climate in Texas today. Thank, thank you, Chelsea, and please give, please give David our best. Senator Jose Rodriguez represents District 29 in the Texas Senate. He served as the El Paso County Attorney for 17 years, where he focused on rehabilitation for juvenile and drug offenders. The Family Law Section of the State Bar named him the Legislator of the Year for his work in civil, civil and criminal litigation, as well as Best of the Senate by the Combined Law Enforcement Association of Texas. Without any further ado, Senator Jose Rodriguez. Thank you. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. See, we can wake people up here. Um, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, I'm going to uh, try to give a review of some of the bills that we're going to be looking at in the next session and some of the thoughts that I have about juvenile justice reform. A lot of my thinking is, in fact, influenced by Dr. Favelo. Uh, if you don't haven't read his reports in the past, I suggest that you do so because I think he provides a guideposts, if you will, for, for uh, reform on issues involving juveniles. And uh, I certainly, over the years, took to heart a lot of things he was saying. For example, 
Uh, I got elected in 93. 95 is when we had all that hard on crime, tough on crime uh, approach, which I'm glad we finally got away from, uh, thanks to the Texas Public Policy Foundation with their Smart on Crime program, which I support for the most part. For the most part, as they know, we've had meetings. Uh, but, but everything that I think the Smart on Crime program is about is where we should be headed in terms of reform, uh, rehabilitation, diversion, providing more services, cutting the costs of uh, incarcerating juveniles, and so forth. So uh, I'd like to offer you my perspective as a, not only as a legislator, but as a county attorney that prosecuted crime for almost 20 years. Uh, and and uh, I felt very strongly about those issues to the point where back in 95, during that tough on crime period, uh, looking at one of Tony's reports or preliminary reports, uh, subsequent to that, uh, I think I may have had, Tony, maybe about three or four juvenile stridus adults. I simply did not believe in that system because of reports that were being issued out of Florida and other places that indicated that that was hardly having an impact on recidivism rates and certainly turning out juveniles with much more criminal uh, background than they had going in. Uh, so that's just one example, Tony, that you had an influence on me about. So I, I, I felt like we needed to hold juveniles accountable, but that we ought to be focusing on rehabilitation, on diversion, on intervention. Uh, we created, for example, in El Paso County, a teen court program, uh, not because it was my brainchild, it was already in place in other parts of the country, and I felt that we needed to try that approach uh, in order to focus on rehabilitating juveniles, giving them an alternative to incarceration, and allowing us to appropriately focus our resources uh, on addressing the root causes, the root causes of what that particular juvenile had committed, uh, why the juvenile had committed the crime, uh, and of course focusing on prevention. I have similar perspectives as a legislator, as a legislator on, e on evaluating the effectiveness of our criminal justice system. So from a policy perspective, both for the juvenile uh, system as well as the adult uh, offender system, it seems to me that we do need to hold them accountable. We gotta send that message, but we need to do it in a way that makes sense in the long term for society as a whole, keeping in mind the state's limited resources and how we can best use those limited resources. Uh, this is especially true, in my view, for your teenagers or children that have made a mistake. Uh, in today's system, the future of a lot of these kids is limited by having a criminal record, which in turn greatly limits whether they're gonna be able to go to college, what kind of job they're gonna be able to get, whether they're gonna be able to lead productive lives. Uh, all of these factors make it more likely that they're going to be effectively marginalized by society and therefore more likely to commute future crimes than contributing to society in a meaningful way. So from a budget perspective, we can handle juveniles within the criminal justice system and co will continue to have a significant impact on our state if we do it uh, in a smart way. And, and uh, there, there are many things that one can look at if you want to uh, consider uh, the budget, for example, you know that spending on criminal justice issues makes up about 6% of the state's budget. Uh, every year we spend about $5.1 in all funds incarcerating adult offenders. Housing, security, classification, food, other necessities, health care, treatment services. And what's notable about this dollar amount is that nearly all of it, almost $5 billion, comes from the general fund and general fund dedicated funds, or in other words, our state funds and particularly relevant to our discussion today is the last legislative session allocated $645.7 million in all funds for juvenile services. Similar to what we spend for adult offenders, about 90% came from GR or general revenue. So looking at these dollar figures, it's incumbent on legislators to find ways to reduce the billions of dollars that we spend every year to incarcerate adults and juvenile offenders. So this brings me back to policy. I think by making significant policy changes, we can reduce the burden placed on the state to incarcerate offenders. It's that simple. We need to reform, reform our current system 
to make sure that once they serve their sentences, offenders, all offenders, but particularly juvenile offenders, uh, can finish their education, get a job, and generally become productive, law-abiding members of our community. So during this session, we expect to have several legislative efforts. I know that Representative White will talk about some of these as well. Uh, I'm not going to cover every single potential bill that we're going to, to address. Uh, I've got about five areas that I think are going to be at the top of the agenda. Uh, one that has received extensive media attention, of course, is raising the age. What does that mean? Right now, juveniles are considered to be juveniles under our system from the ages of 10 to, to 16. And so the question is, should we raise the juvenile age to 17, to 17, um, and have them charged as, as juveniles as opposed to currently being charged as adults? Why would we make this policy, policy change? Well, there's been a lot of studies, there's been a lot of court decisions, particularly Supreme Court decisions recently, that talk about the uh, neurological development of, of kids that it's not the same as adults, that uh, they are not likely to consider the consequences of their actions in the same way that uh, adults might do. And this includes being more susceptible to environmental pressures and more prone to impulsive or risky behaviors. Uh, the Miller decision talks about that extensively, which I'll come to in a minute. So raising the age would ensure that the 17-year-olds receive rehabilitative treatment in age-appropriate settings rather than automatically going into the adult system where they may be exposed to more harmful mental and physical conditions, which is the concern I had with trying juveniles as adults. Can you imagine a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old in the adult prison system? Uh, in addition, there are definitely, and I think there's no question in my mind, some cost savings at the local level since sheriffs uh, would have to expend more resources to separate the 17-year-olds from the, from the adult offenders. Uh, another legislative effort underway in this session involves the sentencing of juveniles. Last session, we had uh, the legislature enact Senate Bill 2. I was the only senator who voted against it. Uh, it's a bill which eliminated life without parole for 17-year-olds convicted of a capital offense. Okay. Uh, and this was done in order to conform to the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Miller versus Alabama, which outlawed uh, punishment for juveniles that called for life without parole. Now, why did I vote against it? Because I, in Texas, what we did is to say, okay, we're going to do away with life without parole, so we're going to now, on capital offenses, sentence you to 40 years that you've got to complete before you're eligible to be paroled. Okay, do you see the difference there? Life without parole at all versus, okay, you can get parole, but you gotta serve 40 years first. Now, why did I have a problem with that? Well, several reasons. One is the U.S. Sentencing Commission defined a life sentence, defines a life sentence as 470 months, which is just over 39 years. So based on average life expectancy, are those serving prison sentence, sentences, you essentially are <coughs> confining them to life without parole, right? Uh, and secondly, in the Miller case, the court struck down the mandatory sentences for life without the poss possibility of parole for capital crimes uh, for kids that were under 18 at the time of the offense. Uh, it was as a violation, and, and, and people said, th the court said, this is a violation of the Eighth Amendment uh, prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. But tellingly, in the decision, the court said this, judges and juries should be able to impose individualized sentences based on the crime and other factors that are involved in the case, taking into consideration the unique characteristics of juveniles, uh, such as what? Well, their age, family, home environment, circumstances of the homicide offense, including familiar and peer pressure and other factors. So this to me is a more rational way of approaching these kinds of cases and I think that we have opened up ourselves to more litigation as a result of not uh, allowing judges or, or juries in particular uh, make an assessment on these factors before they impose the punishment. So I'm going to kind of cut short what I have here down 
uh, because uh, I wanted to cover failure to attend school. Uh, you know, we, we, we are going to be looking at, and I serve on the Jurisprudence Committee, decriminalizing truancy. We're one of only, what, six states, two states in the country that criminalize truancy. Uh, we have more cases under our criminal truancy system than all the other states combined in the union. So that gives you an idea. We're going to have to do something about that. That's one of our recommendations in the Jurisprudence Committee. Uh, and another issue is going to be how we handle juvenile records. Uh, Representative White and I uh, passed legislation during the last session that created an advisory committee to examine fingerprinting practices of juveniles. Uh, this was a committee comprised of various stakeholders, including uh, TJJD. And in addition to making recommendations relating to uh, fingerprinting practices, the advisory committee members are recommending that this coming session uh, we create another advisory committee to examine best practices surrounding the dissemination and confidentiality of juvenile records. Um, finally, I think uh, status offenses are going to be uh, 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 on the burner, uh, like running away, breaking curfew, consuming or possessing alcohol. Uh, these kinds of status offenses are, you know, really clogging up our courts. So what we can do with them is, you know, focus more on uh, providing uh, community services, tutoring, issues like that, that uh, are less expensive and probably more effective. So I think that overall, uh, juveniles end up in our system because of either family or systemic issues, uh, locking them up for their offenses not only places pressure on limited state and local resources, but it does very little to rehabilitate them, in my view. Uh, we should be focused instead on investing in prevention, in diversion programs, as well as providing services in age-appropriate settings in the community, instead of in state and secure uh, county facilities, especially for children that are ages 10 to 13. So I look forward to working with the foundation as well as, as, well as our agency folks and uh, and my fellow legislators to bring about some of these reforms that I think are long overdue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Representative James White was elected to the Texas House of Representatives in 2010 for District 19. He is a member of the Republican Caucus, the Tea Party Caucus, the Legislative Black Caucus, Rural Caucus, Manufacturing Caucus, Energy Caucus, and Texas Conservative Coalition. A lot of cockeye there. Um, <laughs> Kurt, did, Kurt, did, you, did you say World Caucus? <laughs> no. Oh, Rural Caucus. Rural caucus. It might be, might be in there somewhere, Senator. Yeah, exactly. currently, <laughs> Representative White currently serves on the Joint Committee on Human Trafficking, the Agriculture and Livestock Committee, and is the Vice Chairman of the Corrections Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, Representative James White. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. And first, uh, let me also uh, thank all of y'all for coming and showing the interest in this uh, topic. It's a very important topic. Um, obviously, it's about maybe five or six million, maybe about a quarter of our state's population, but uh, it's 100% of our future when you look at uh, juveniles. I will, as I did last year, I will stick to uh, the old second lieutenant's briefing uh, rule, be bold, be brief, and be gone. So I probably will not use all of my 10 minutes. Um, but looking at the next session, um, I, it's, it's, a, it's quite interesting. Uh, where I started in 2011 when we did this uh, big old merger, and um, uh, obviously there was a whole lot of other noise involved in how that merger was motivated. Uh, it was a very interesting budget cycle. Uh, sometimes we look at legislation, you got to look at sort of how the environment it was um, created or fostered or how that legislation was written. So uh, that re legislation, at least from my perspective as a freshman sitting at the table on corrections, uh, was that we were trying to meet a, a budget scenario. Uh, obviously, we wanted to do something that was right by kids, but it was the budget scenario that was definitely, uh, you know, kind of instigating this process. So when I look at the merger of TJJD, uh, and I talk to people about it and uh, listen to people as they talk about it, understand that it was uh, a fiscal issue uh, primarily, at least during 
that session. But with that said, um, I'm, I'm very proud of a lot of the stakeholders, a lot of the folks over at TJJD. Um, I am definitely looking forward to working more with Dr. Riley. Uh, I think he has exactly the right type of temperament. Uh, he's very calm and uh, low drama type of a guy. I think that's the type of guy you need in this type of business here, dealing with uh, uh, our juveniles that are dealing with some challenging issues. And I would like to commend them. Um, I didn't think they were going to come, but they did. But um, they loaded up, and all of them came out to East Texas with a whole bunch of other people, and we had a real uh, sit-down discussion about a lot of issues dealing with juvenile justice. And I believe that leads us to what Senator Rodriguez started, is the next session in legislation, uh, because that's what we're up here for. And uh, when I listen to, um, to our researchers, and one of the things that caught me was you discuss how the recidivism rate is, is high, uh, especially uh, those juveniles that have been involved in our, um, for our f facilities. And you kind of wonder, well, what, what is the rationale behind that? All right, and I was just sitting there trying to think about it. Uh, one thing we, pro uh, one hypothesis we probably want to throw out there is um, the, the population has decreased. Obviously, we've, uh, we're receiving the tougher kids as far as the challenges that are confronting them. So um, it's possible that whatever, can, wh whatever programs that we're using uh, are not probably suited for that population. So we got fewer kids, but the recidivism rate is up. Um, and, and so we need to look at the programming um, involved and understand that these are probably the tougher ones that they're sending us uh, from the counties. And then still in the counties, it seems like the, uh, the recidivism rate is up um, or still high. Uh, that's very interesting in of itself, uh, something I'm just thinking about why is that the case. Maybe it's because these are um, less dangerous or less serious offenses. Uh, so maybe I just do them more until, you know, I get the necessary programming and I get the message and I don't uh, recidivate anymore. But it's something definitely to look at. Uh, a lot of the figures, uh, money's being spent. Uh, you know, number of people, number of juveniles are, are down in our system, but the amount of monies that are being spent, that's very interesting uh, to look at, okay? Uh, next session from a fiscal standpoint. But all in all, um, I'm always wondering, uh, I, I never, you, you know, you're always challenging uh, the conventional wisdom. Uh, during the interim, we had a very vigorous Chairman Parker kept this in, 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 in hearings throughout the summer and the fall and was a very vigorous interim, uh, learned a lot. And uh, we, we see here that, you know, our commitment rate is still decreasing as it has been since 2009. Now, why is that? Uh, is it, is it a, some type of demographic issue? Uh, you know, Maybe kids are doing more stuff inside than outside because you can do all these games and whatnot. Um, you're not probably going outside much. Um, is it, uh, you know, the, our society is getting older. Uh, you know, you always want to challenge the conventional wis wisdom. Uh, never want to just always take all the credit why these uh, numbers are going down and what we're doing is actually working. So therefore, we just keep doing it. Uh, we have to challenge the conventional wisdom. And challenging the conventional wisdom. You know, I filed a, a quite a few truancy um, uh, decriminalization bills and I've gotten a, quite a few calls um, uh, from justices of the peace, uh, had a talk with, a, a, with an assistant principal, and uh, conventional wisdom. Uh, it's under their, it's in their opinion, and I need all of you to, when you go back home, to, to talk with these folks and really sit down with them um, uh, I, I, I was a school teacher before I was elected uh, to the legislature. Uh, if I was continuing, continuously sending kids to the office, I probably wouldn't have a job, but if I was continuously sending kids to the office, uh, someone would say that is not an effective disciplinary technique. Uh, kids are not in classroom, they're in, they're, they're in the principal's office, they're not getting instruction, uh, their academic achievement is uh, not being uh, taken care of. 
uh, but I do have local officials that believe that um, rounding up uh, kids that are having challenges getting to school, uh, putting them in jail, or the threat that you can go to jail is an effective tool to get people in school. Now, what's the primary problem with that? Well, uh, Mary Bo B. Lamar, uh, he's the father of Texas education, at least Texas public education. The whole idea of having a public education system is to teach young people their rights and responsibilities as free citizens in a republic. Uh, I think it's kind of uh, it's, it's inconsistent rounding people up to throw them in jail for not coming to learn how to be a free citizen. So we need to come up with some <laughs> so we need to come up with some new techniques. But I talked to a principal a day. This particular person was in my district, and he thinks this is a if he doesn't have this tool, um, he's not going to be able to get them to school. And then he starts lathering it up on me. You know, you've got all these tests, you've got all these um, accountability measures, and uh, by God, um, if you're going to hold teachers accountable, principals accountable, school boards accountable, we need to hold parents and students accountable. And I quickly told him I agree. Uh, but I don't know if uh, rounding up kids that aren't in school and, and throwing them in jail for not showing up to school. The one question that I usually ask is if you can, uh, this one justice of the peace that said he actually puts them in jail. And I said, well, if you, if you do that, can't you just, if you can pick them up to take them to jail, can't you pick them up and just take them to the classroom? And he said, yes, he does. He said, yeah, he says, he says, oh, they go to school. He just makes sure he, he gets them in school from Monday to Friday and um, puts them in jail over the weekend. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> we need to continue <laughs> testing the conventional wisdom out there. Thank you all so much for your interest and I look forward to working with you during the session. Thank you, Representative White. Ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the part of the program where we're going to engage in question and answers. If you would like, um, if you, we have a microphone there in the back. If you would like to just raise your hand, Ebony will seek you out, and uh, we'll be able to answer, a ask a question of this particular panel. Uh, before we begin, though, I'd like to uh, take the moderator's prerogative and ask a question uh, to follow up on something that Senator Rodriguez brought up. Uh, Senator Rodriguez, you brought up the discussion, and this, was, um, this has happened uh, several times in the interim in uh, Representative White's committee. You brought up raise the age. Uh, what I would like to ask uh, every member of this panel is from their particular, um, from their particular vantage point, uh, any opinion on the act, any sort of policy uh, recommendation or anything that can be done in that regard and why that is. And can we start with you, Dr. Cabello? arbitrary decisions by the legislature. That's why for certain things you can vote when you're 18, but you cannot drink until you're 21. So what if you, you, you're immature to vote, but you're mature to drink? So different on this different age. So no specific position, just make sure you analyze it well. Well, I'll give the <laughs> we'll do exactly what the legislature tells us to do, and that's the honest truth. Um, we will. Uh, there are arguments for and, and against raise, raise the age, and um, I think the only thing that, that we would say is that there is, if, if it does pass, that, it, that there be given time to do so in a way that um, allows for planning and um, um, for heard the arguments on both sides and, and a lot of, they're worthy. 
Well, and in my case, what I would tell you is uh, raise the age uh, to 17. Uh, and I think Dr. Favelo is right. There are consequences to it. I mean, but they are, they are fiscal consequences. They are the numbers. They are the way the system operates. But when all is said and done, if we look at, 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 a, at a kid, whether it's a kid, a 10-year-old or a 17-year-old, what the Supreme Court in, in the Miller decision said is for kids that are under 18, that includes the 17-year-olds, uh, we've got to look at these various individualized factors that contribute to their delinquency. And that, that to me is the correct way of addressing uh, this issue of whether 17-year-olds um, should be treated as juveniles versus adults. Because in my view, from my experience, 17-year-olds uh, a lot, I mean, you can have 14-year-olds that can be cold-blooded killers just the way you can have 17-year-olds that can be cold-blooded killer, killers, but they're still children. And, and, and if you treat them as adults, then what that implicates is they're into the adult system, they're not getting the services that, that they are eligible to get in the juvenile system, and which are more likely, and I think have proven successful, in rehabilitating uh, kids. So that, that would be my reasoning for supporting the, raising the age. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just uh, still open. Just a tabula rasa, just taking it all in. Uh, I had, like the TJJD and a lot of the advocates, came out to Southeast Texas a few months ago and talked talk with my local government officials and other stakeholders about it. We got a lot of questions that need to be asked. Uh, there are a lot of issues that need to be resolved from a fiscal standpoint. Uh, yes, uh, somebody's got to write the check, somebody's got to be the grown up in the room, and, and that's a commissioner's court and that is a legislator uh, or a legislature. So um, I'm, again, look, I don't, generally I don't think the society right now, the, the way it's moving uh, or thinking, they want to hold people accountable. You know, that's why you got all these scorecards, when, you know, when, on, when I do legislative votes. Everybody wants to hold you accountable. Um, uh, we do all types of uh, statistics on, in, in sports. You know, everybody wants to hold folks accountable. I don't trying to get a, a gauge on does the public uh, want to change that accountability level. Uh, at 17 years old, I was a, uh, a young soldier and 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 working with all the implements of violence in order to uh, protect the freedom of this country at 17. Uh, so I had that. Uh, responsibility. So I think we need to look at a, a lot of things, but it needs to make sense. So uh, 14, 15 years old, going to jail because you missed a, a few days of school, probably not the smart thing. 17-year-old um, uh, and um, uh, you did a mass killing, maybe we do, do need to do something um, on, on an adult, in an adult way there. So um, I will just continue to listen to the debate and uh, I think probably the safe thing, and that's usually what I, I think I kind of want to do most of the time, uh, the safe thing is to, over the next interim, is get the stakeholders around the table and let's talk about this and let's do it right. And because um, I've seen some situations like in 2011 when we were merging organizations and a lot of people have a lot of uh, misgivings about that. I, I want to add something that probably should be mentioned and that is that there's a number of states, I forget the number, that treat 17-year-olds as juveniles. So number one, the sky hasn't fallen because we've raised the age to 17. Uh, and uh, I think what, what it shows is that in places like Texas and other few places where there are juveniles only up to 16, it, it's a matter of geography as to whether or not you are treated as a juvenile versus as an adult. And I don't think that makes any sense in this country as far as how we deal with juveniles. I'll, I'll say I, I, 40 states um, have a maximum age of 17, and eight um, have maximum age of 16, and we are among those. Excellent. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the crowd? Hey, well, I'll yes, sir. Not yes, sir. sir. Oh, yeah. We'll go here and then in the back. Please. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm actually from Illinois. I'm a state rep in Illinois, and uh, Illinois is one of those states that actually uh, raised the age. Um, as a police officer, I hated it initially. 
Um, but it actually has become something that um, uh, all law enforcement have gotten behind. Uh, it, it, it actually passed in the General Assembly uh, with strong bipartisan support. Um, the Illinois Juvenile Justice Commission was actually the, um, they actually put forth the um, study and that's how we came about the legislation. Um, so, I mean, that, it's something that, um, as someone who was in former law enforcement, it, it actually has worked out well. Especially when, I mean, I was a juvenile officer, so a lot of the old guys would just come and dump the, ki the kids off and no longer had to be concerned with them, so that was one issue. But the, m the question I wanted to, to ask was, um, I sat over the summer on a joint committee on criminal justice reform in Illinois. We're actually looking to change a lot. Uh, in, in my opinion, I, I feel like some of it is just window dressing, but I would love to know what Texas is doing. Uh, if, if there are any bills um, that are forthcoming, because in Illinois, we don't get to see what bills we're going to be um, debating in the General Assembly. It comes because, well, I won't say, because the godfather of Illinois <laughs> probably has his room uh, mic. <laughs> that? that would be Mike Madigan, you know, okay. Speaker okay. Madigan. But, okay. um, um, but I would love to know what Texas is doing, because Illinois is really trying to get behind the push to uh, reform criminal, uh, criminal justice. Uh, I personally, I think it needs to be done. Uh, I, think it, I think the time is ripe. I think across the nation, people are yearning for it. Uh, I think I heard someone say something about it being a uh, revenue, uh, something about revenue or, or the budget. And in and, and, and all truth of the matter, that's part of the issue and part of the problem, um, especially, especially in a state like Illinois. You know, we don't compare to wh what you guys do down here. We're in so much debt and we have over $5 billion in unpaid just bills. So uh, I would love if I can, um, to the legislators, to the senator and the representative, if I can share information with you. I came here to glean. I came here. I'm a sponge. I want to take back what you guys are doing because the, the, the nation looks at Texas. And I want to be able to go back to Illinois and, and, and possibly introduce a lot of the things that I'm here to learn today. So thank you. Great question, sir. Thank you. Oh, it's Senator Representative. We're just supposed to start. You want to start. Well, well, well I, I think if you get the little handout that the Texas Public Policy Foundation has on, on a lot of the items, they, they pretty much encapsulate what it is that we're going to be doing. Now, some of those may not succeed. There's a couple that I have to, I didn't say I was opposed to them. I said I would kind of wanted more information, look at them further. But by and large, the whole list is acceptable to me. And I come from a different spectrum uh, of the political arena, but but I, I agree it's 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 the right way to go, uh, and so I think if you get that, you'll get a sense of what it is that we're going to be working on, and and the reasons why we're working on that because I think their paper uh, articulates it very well. And and um, more on on a practical note. Um, you know, have a lot of people at the table and also lean on your local government officials. Um, I think th one, one thing about Texas, you know, going from state to state, I think our counties tend to be a little bit more independent to a certain extent. And um, even though they are political subdivisions of the state, so if one of my county commissioners are listening, they, they know that there's still a public, there's still a political subdivision of the state, but there's still have a level of independence and even fiscal independence. So whatever we do in the legislature, uh, ultimately, you know, even that county commissioner's court or that city or police department is going to have to write a check as well. Excellent. Thank you. I believe we had one question up here. <laughs> well, um, it's been a classroom teacher when a student is not behaving in class. I can't just I couldn't just round somebody up and have them uh, throw them in prison. Okay. Um, what we need to do on the state level is continue to give your justices of the peace and your counties and your school districts more tools and means in order to help these kids. Let me give you an example. One judge, justice of the peace I was talking to, he, he's in the middle of a lot of his, his precinct is situated with a lot of industry. Of course, they want a trained, educated workforce. They're willing to provide some uh, private donations to help kids that are probably missing school because 
uh, they need some clothing items or they need school supplies. But uh, our state statutes and policies don't allow him to take private donations. So it's something like that we can go in and help him with and give him that tool to work with his community industry so he can have some other resources to help these kids uh, encourage them to come to school and stay, to, stay in school. Uh, you, you, you're raising, I think, a very fundamental question as to how we approach addressing uh, juvenile justice issues and crime issues in general. Uh, I, th I think that there's plenty of programs out there. I mentioned Teen Court that, that I initiated. There's uh, drug counseling programs. There's uh, anger management. There is, you know, uh, cleanup in the neighborhood, uh, there, there's all kinds of things that can be done with kids. But the, the problem that we run into in this, in, on this is the, the politics of it, right? If you're talking about more diversion, more prevention, intervention, then you know people, as our friend from Illinois just pointed out, when he was a policeman, he had a different attitude. Why? Because there are certain expectations that we have uh, in our society about our respective roles. And if you're a cop or if you're a prosecutor like I was, you're expected to lock him up and throw away the key, which is what I was told back in 95 when we had the tough on crime stance in this state and went into the biggest prison building boom uh, and increased the sentences for juveniles and adults and so forth, right? My attitude was, in fact, it was, I'm proud to say, kind of like the policy foundation's attitude now, which was, you know what? And I used to talk about it with the most conservative groups over in the Fort Bliss area, the retired military families. I said, look, we, we need to be smarter on crime. We're talking about kids. There are different approaches and ways that we can take to get these kids in the right path as opposed to having them land up in our facilities that are gonna cost you three times as much. You know, you complain about having to pay taxes and increase taxes, well, you're paying a hell of a lot more when they're confined than if you're gonna invest in a program such as some of the, that I've described to you. But if you're an elected person getting into the, into the, into the political arena, you're a, a, a prosecutor, you know, it's, it, not, not everybody's willing to just kinda step up and say, you know what, I'm gonna take a different approach. But knowing that, you know, half of the community or maybe in some cases all of the community is is, is uh, uh, focused on more incarceration, regardless of what you say in terms of the costs, right? People are fearful, people create that fearful uh, environment and, and people can get irrational about things. And so I'm, I'm glad that we're finally getting around to having these conversations about what makes sense why is prevention, intervention, diversion much more effective in reducing crime than putting people behind bars, whether they're kids or adults? Uh, I used to tell my prosecutors, I, had, I have a staff of about 97, 37 of them lawyers in the county attorney's office in El Paso, and I would tell the juvenile unit lawyers, I am not impressed if you come back and you tell me that you have 100% you know, adjudication I'm gonna say adjudication because that's what applies for juveniles, not conviction, right? Adjudication record, I'm not impressed in the least. I wanna know whether you, as a juvenile prosecutor, have had an impact in reducing juvenile crime in the community. And to do that, you got to focus on talking to the parents, you gotta focus on talking to the kids. I required them to go to school. I would go to the schools, talk to the parents, and insist that we had a role to play as prosecutors beyond just simply processing cases and processing kids into the system, in and out of the system. Yeah, and just, just real quick. Yes, sir. And you know, my mentor in education once told me that learning is when the student comes to school and picks the learning material up and engages in the learning process. So just because they're coming to school, that may be compliance. Uh, that, 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 that doesn't mean learning is going on. So we also need to be more open-minded, all of us, on different learning delivery models. Uh, maybe this model doesn't work for this student. It, it may be a, a different one. Uh, we need to be open about different types of educational choice opportunities. 
uh, different, you know, vocational, college track. Uh, stop just thinking everyone, every, every young person needs to be on the same track, doing the same thing all the time. So yes, um, they're, they're opting. They're, they're, actually, the truant is doing education choice. That, that is their voucher. They're gone. So we can do it one way or the other. We can have something over here in a program institutionalized way, okay, to keep them in school learning, or they'll exercise choice on their own. 